Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. Welcome to Great Decisions 2021, sponsored by the World Affairs Council of St. Louis. <clears throat> My name is Joel Glassman. I'm the Vice President of the World Affairs Council of St. Louis, and I will be serving as your host for this program. I'd like to begin by thanking the University of Missouri St. Louis and their international office, UMSL Global, for their continuing support and sponsorship uh, of this program in collaboration with the World Affairs Council. The World Affairs Council of St. Louis is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization that connects the St. Louis metropolitan region to the world. We were founded in 1948, and our mission is to offer programs which promote understanding, engagement, relationships, and leadership in world affairs. This particular program, Great Decisions, is a national program of the Foreign Policy Association that was founded in 1918, more than 100 years ago. The Great Decisions program is itself more than 70 years old and provides the opportunity for US audiences to learn about and understand the complex foreign policy issues of our day. Foreign Policy Association and Great Decisions operate on the principle that an informed citizenry is essential for a democratic society. Great Decisions, the Great Decisions Program is the largest US-based discussion program about world affairs. It has been our honor in the World Affairs Council to serve as the local host for this important program for more than a decade. Our agenda today will be similar to the agenda we followed in the recent past. We'll begin with a five minute preview of a video prepared by the Foreign Policy Association about today's topic. We will then have a 30 minute presentation by our guest speaker today, Professor Anna Santos Ruchman from St. Louis University. I'll introduce her at greater length just before she begins to speak. Following her lecture, we'll have a roughly 20 to 25 minute Q&A session, and we'll lay out the ground rules for that just before we start that. And finally, we will conclude with the remaining 20 plus minutes of the Foreign Policy Association video. Our program will end no later than 1.30 PM. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And let's uh, start by introducing today's topic. COVID-19 and the role of the World Health Organization is a topic very familiar to all of us. Did the World Health Organization do a good job or a bad job in managing this global pandemic? And what if any steps could be taken in the future to improve their performance by the, the, the global organization 
most responsible for dealing with global pandemics with a near certain understanding that we are likely to have pandemics confronting us in the future. As you all know, the, the issue of the role and performance of the World Health Organization was intensely politicized in the US as well as in other parts of the world. That whole issue has become um, relevant once again as President Biden recently ordered the, his, his intelligence services to make a final assessment, a definitive assessment of how and why the global pandemic started and that will inevitably raise issues about the, once again, raise issues about the performance of the World Health Organization. But let's move forward and show the beginning of the video prepared by the Foreign Policy Association as a way of formally introducing our topic. Bob, would you start the video? The world is still grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a critical moment in the outbreak response. For us all, the fastest way for us to get through this is to act together. In the spring of 2020, as a microscopic but deadly virus brought the world to a grinding halt, the President of the United States fixed his ire on an unlikely target. We will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization and redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. The organization once lauded for ridding the world of smallpox and bringing polio to the brink of eradication has become a political flashpoint. Great Decisions investigates the global response to COVID-19, explores how geopolitical rivalries are spilling over into the realm of public health, and asks how the international community can prepare for the next pandemic. The World Health Organization, next on Great Decisions. Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, Pricewaterhouse Coopers LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. week of May 2020, as an anxious spring rolled into a tragic summer, the 100,000th American died from COVID-19, and Donald Trump stepped into the Rose Garden to prosecute his case against the People's Republic of China. Chinese officials ignored their reporting obligations to the World Health Organization and pressured the World Health Organization to mislead the world when the virus was first discovered by Chinese authorities. At issue were the early weeks of the outbreak. American officials alleged that China was too slow to warn the rest of the world about the dangers of the new virus. Certainly probably November and December of 2019, there was likely an outbreak happening in Wuhan that China hid from WHO and really only let WHO know on December 31st, 2019. And much of January, as WHO tried to get more information, China was hiding that information and just not being as forthcoming as it should have been. It wasn't a shortage of proper rules and regulations that allowed China to obstruct the World Health Organization investigation for too long. It was a problem of China, first and foremost, being obstructionist, not being transparent, being more concerned about its reputation than about averting a global pandemic. We now have a name for the disease, and it is COVID-19. It's quite clear that China was relying on WHO to delay the response to the COVID-19 and also to understate 
the severity of COVID-19 in the early stage. And I think Beijing has made it very clear that they don't care who's responsible as long as China is not held responsible. As COVID-19 exploded into a worldwide pandemic, some experts worry that the international response was leaderless and uncoordinated. It requires coordination at every level, globally, nationally, and locally. And we're seeing a real patchwork of responses that, frankly, is undermining our ability to beat this virus. There is not a clear global leader in the fight against COVID. In some ways, WHO is the closest that we have, and I think they are, they're pretty valiantly trying to play that role, but they're doing it with limited capacity and very limited authority and at the mercy of member states' willingness to cooperate. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Professor Anna Santos Ruchman, Professor of Law at St. Louis University to be our guest speaker. She joined the, the SLU Law Faculty in 2018. She previously had taught at DePaul University College of Law as the inaugural Jaharis Fellow in Health Law and Intellectual Property. Prior to her stint at DePaul University, she consulted for the World Health Organization from 2015 to 2016. We're very fortunate to have a person with firsthand experience at the World Health Organization to discuss this very important and indeed controversial issue. So Professor uh, Santos Ruchman will speak for approximately 30 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A session uh, the way to submit your questions is through the Q&A feature of uh, a Zoom. I'll take the questions off of the Q&A function and direct them to uh, our speaker. I'll remind you about that again, but you can start sending your questions almost immediately. Uh, Professor Santos Ruchman. You're muted. Um, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I, I would say it's a pleasure to be here. I'm in St. Louis physically. I wish we could be meeting in, um, in person. Hopefully um, that will happen on another occasion. Um, I'm going to just take a second to share my screen with you. I do have some PowerPoints. And could I get confirmation that you can see the PowerPoints, Joel? I can. All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, I... Um, I come from St. Louis University. Um, I do have um, some experience working with the World Health Organization. I would not say at the World Health Organization, most uh, of the work I did actually entailed going somewhere else other than Geneva when I was consulting um, for them. Uh, but I want to, um, to be very clear uh, about what the relationship looked like. So I was a consultant um, for them on a project related um, to the Ebola and Zika vaccine races. So a few years ago, um, and so that's the context um, uh, under which I worked um, for them. Obviously, what I'm about to say today is as you know, one would expect informed by some of that of that experience, um, but but obviously also um, exclusively my opinion on some um, of the WHO related um, issues that we'll be talking um, about, um, about today. I'm, um, as, um, as per the introduction, um, I'm a law professor uh, and I work also in, um, in health um, policy, global health um, policy, but obviously I come to you with a particular um, background. So uh, my, I think my presentation is going to reflect a little bit um, that particular side of my background. Um, if there's anything I don't touch um, on um, throughout the presentation, 
I can still try at least to answer your questions during um, during the Q&A. But today what I'm going to do is talk about the different roles of the WHO during um, the, the pandemic um, and some of the more recent things that the WHO has been doing in the international uh, public health law uh, space. Um, and in doing so, I'll, I'll try to assess a little bit um, some of the successes and some of the failures, right? Already the video pointed at some credibility um, issues, coordination uh, problems. So I'll try to flag those out um, for you um, as I present. Uh, I'm going to start actually uh, a few years before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the excerpt that you see um, here, so emerging pathogens likely to cause a severe outbreak in the near future, comes from an R&D blueprint that the WHO uh, put together in 2015, so during Ebola, Zika, um, during those two public health crises. Um, and this is called an R&D research and development um, blueprint. And in that blueprint, so about six years ago, almost six years ago, um, the WHO listed pathogens that um, public health experts and the organization itself thought were likely to cause an outbreak in the near future. So um, you see um, Ebola disease, for instance, Ebola virus disease um, here. Um, you see a couple of viruses that maybe you're not as familiar with. Um, they are uh, typically not endemic um, to, to the US, so ten, we tend to think of them as more the you know, rare tropical diseases. Um, uh, you see a novel agent, which is uh, the scary one, you know, a, a type of virus we don't know yet about, but you also see coronaviruses um, here. So um, the WHO knew perfectly well and was uh, cautioning the international community about the possibility of um, an outbreak caused by a, a novel um, coronavirus. Essentially, uh, we've not called it SARS-2, but um, you know, it, it's not a perfect parallel, but that's sort of what we're going through uh, right now. Uh, and in fact, a few years after this, um, being uh, being predicted by the organization, reflecting um, general scientific uh, knowledge. It was not by any means a groundbreaking um, statement. Uh, we did have one of these outbreaks. The reason I start here, as opposed to starting, uh, you know, in late 2019, early 2020, uh, when when the outbreak of COVID-19 did begin is because not only was this an alert to the international community saying we will experience one of these outbreaks where we're convinced fairly, fairly um, soon. Um, this was, uh, as I mentioned, an R&D blueprint. So the larger conclusion by the, the World Health Organization was that should one of these viruses um, cause a severe um, outbreak as we expect uh, one of them to do, uh, we are not prepared. So we collectively, globally, um, are going through a, a period of uh, lack of preparedness, they literally called it at a lack of R&D preparedness, meaning that even though we knew one of these would cause uh, an outbreak, we were not putting enough money and effort and coordination at the country level, at the regional level, at the, the global level, really, to prepare for a, a pandemic, even for, uh, for an epidemic. Um, so th this was the alarm sounded by the WHO in the wake of Ebola and, uh, and, and Zika. And frankly, um, as I'll point out uh, in, in a few minutes, not a whole lot uh, changed in terms of preparedness. So when we talk, I think, about the role of the WHO in responding to COVID-19, it's important to look to the recent past. I think not only how WHO has acted in, in, in recent outbreaks, Ebola, Zika, and the like, but also these calls from the WHO um, that have gone largely unheeded um, by um, countries and international players in the public health um, space. So fast forward to COVID-19, uh, uh, WHO has been saying for a number of years that we are underprepared for, um, for an outbreak. Um, and uh, one begins, a large outbreak uh, begins in very late 2019. We now, uh, we now know the video that we watched pointed, um, um, pointed out already uh, or, or began to uncover certain aspects of the deficiencies of the early response. Um, to, um, to the pandemic, not just necessarily by the World Health um, Organization, um, but um, not everything went, um, I think I will make the case um, in a second, not everything went um, as it probably should have gone from a public health uh, perspective and in terms of an early concerted response um, to, uh, to the outbreak. Uh, 
even though there were some failures and I'll point them out, the ones that I see, I'll, I'll point them out um, in, in upcoming um, slides. I thought I'd take a moment to go through some of the rules of the World Health Organization in COVID-19 specifically, but I would say that by looking at what WHO has done in the context of this pandemic, uh, we're seeing replicas of things that the um, WHO normally does in the response to a, a pandemic um, or, uh, or an epidemic. So um, I'm actually using um, here language from the WHO itself. Um, and this is how they portray um, their uh, their own role. And uh, there's a few more that I'll add on um, to. Uh, but, but I thought it was important to highlight the different functions of the WHO, because this is a series about international organizations. And one of the things that I'll attempt um, to, to highlight today is this idea that we're seeing the WHO intervening in many areas that I don't think we're natural fits for um, the organization um, a couple of decades ago. That's the later part of my presentation. But for instance, now that we are facing a situation of vaccine scarcity, we've seen the WHO way, wade into the, the patent uh, vaccine uh, debate um, and actually take sides on intellectual property debates. And typically you think that's normally WIPO, right? The World Intellectual Property Organization. But we're seeing WHO, I think, sometimes expanding in, in, in new directions, which is interesting, if, if nothing else, but, but also challenging. It has already with the functions it is supposed. It was designed to, um, uh, to fulfill. Not everything uh, is, uh, is going, uh, not everything has, um, has unfolded during the pandemic as we might have, uh, have expected. But I do want to point out that the WHO has a fundamental um, coordinating uh, role uh, in events like a pandemic and preparing for the next one because the list that I started uh, with, unfortunately, it's not going to go uh, away. It might be uh, updated, but it will not change substantially, right? So we will be preparing, we are preparing already arguably for the next epidemic or, or, or pandemic. So the WHO flawed as the response sometimes might have um, been in recent public health crises, the WHO plays a really important um, role. And as the video, I think, framed it, uh, the closest we have to a centralized uh, role role, uh, a coordinating role in global public health. Um, because if, if you think about it, this is something that cannot fall to a single country, much as some countries might take the lead in the formation of certain partnerships uh, or um, initiatives that might help us throughout uh, a pandemic, um, that we do need some uh, entity that doesn't really have its boundaries drawn uh, by sovereign uh, lines, I think. So we need, I think, uh, an entity, at least a coordinating entity to some, some extent. We have the WHO. I think that in spite of some of the flaws, it plays a really important role, and in fact, more than one role. So here are the things and um, the, the, the different hats that um, WHO puts on um, using its own um, terminology. And are, here are some examples of uh, how the roles play out uh, once a pandemic or epidemic um, unfolds. Um, I used examples from early in the pandemic because I think that has shaped the entire uh, response uh, from WHO, from the international community, and, but also how we now perceive a year and a half later um, the organization. So the first example is that of being an advisory body, an advisory um, entity. So WHO lists as its first first advisory um, action related to COVID-19. And if you think about it, probably in mid-January last year, you had not yet heard uh, of the novel coronavirus and the disease was unknown. So none of us would know what COVID-19 meant um, at, at this point. But in mid-January 2020, having received some reports uh, in light, uh, in very light uh, 2019, December 2019, WHO did uh, start sharing guidance with uh, countries with national level uh, public health oriented um, authorities, agencies, uh, and, uh, and the like, telling them there is a new disease. Uh, we, we confirmed the, the reports and uh, we have preliminary information available on a number of issues. And, and I've highlighted a few 
um, here. And this is an advisory role that the WHO does not only play during a pandemic or epidemic, it's, uh, it's a con constant role of, um, of the organization, uh, but one that sometimes doesn't get fully acknowledged, right? We, we tend to talk about other things the, F the, the, the World Health Organization does or does not do, like declaring uh, the emergency and being more forceful about um, some of its uh, statements and the need for precautionary measures being clear in the way it communicates, right? There were some hiccups at the, the communications um, level, um, particularly earlier in the pandemic, in which sometimes we didn't know exactly where um, the scientific message was, um, was going. Um, so even though um, we tend to focus on the other roles of um, the, the organization, the bread and butter of uh, the WHO really is at the coordinating and advisory uh, level by starting to provide even uh, at preliminary level uh, guidance and you can see how early this one came up in, um, in the outbreak. Now the WHO calls this it's a leadership uh, function um, and, and I would largely agree that uh, we might not have a perfect leader, but the WHO remains the one post World War II, um, you know, system uh, leader in uh, in global public health. There are countries that are prominent in particular ways in global public health. There are countries, for instance, like Norway, who fund a lot of projects, and I'll return to this towards the end, on global public health. Comparatively speaking, countries like Norway, even the US, um, tend to do that, uh, again, on balance, more uh, than other countries. So they, there's a role for national contributions and things that we can individualize and say that country is a, co a contributor um, to global public health in the following way. But no single country or other body that I know uh, of, and I, I think, I suspect most people um, would uh, see it um, similarly, as quite the breadth of um, the WHO, which might be its downfall in the sense that it might just be too big, too gargantuan um, to sometimes accomplish all of the things it's intending um, to do. But it certainly has this uh, role of consolidating uh, voices in, in public, uh, public health um, at the transnational uh, level. And in this sense, they call it leadership. Um, we could uh, call it a few other things. Uh, coordination or, or a few other things, but um, I, I actually think the word um, is accurate um, here. And you can see uh, an expression of that uh, through the declaration uh, of public health emergency of international concern. And probably this is not the pandemic declaration that one came a month and a half um, lighter, and you're probably more familiar with the pandemic um, declaration, and I'll say a few more things about that, but this is really the highest level of alarm that formally the WHO can, um, can issue, and it did so in late January um, of um, 2020. I have a few more things to say about the declaration, but for now I'll just um, sort of um, put it in context. So we have a, a type of action by the agency that's vastly different uh, from providing scientific um, information. The organization also has a scientific a role in, in, in scientific um, arenas. Um, as I uh, mentioned, so the, the images I started the presentation with, WHO was uh, providing a, a list of pathogens uh, that are likely to emerge and cause an outbreak and surveying um, the landscape of diagnostics, uh, treatments, vaccines and the like for um, infectious diseases and saying we are not doing collectively, we're not doing enough in, uh, in, in the field. And WHO also has uh, therefore a coordinating um, role, a convening role, a funding uh, role, um, uh, a role for as facilitator of discussions in the scientific uh, field. And you see it here in regard um, to COVID-19. So mid uh, February, uh, here is uh, one of the things that WHO labels as uh, fitting under its science-driven umbrella. Um, there are many, many embodiments of, uh, of this particular function of, of the WHO, but I think it's important to keep this uh, keep this um, in, in mind, particularly against the backdrop like the one we experienced last year, and we're still, I think, in the midst of it, um, in which if you are in a particular country, you might not know, legitimately not know, uh, whether to trust the scientific information or allegedly, allegedly scientific information being um, 
being conveyed by a different country. Unfortunately, that's the, the type of environment we now live, um, live in. So uh, WHO provides a, a foundational role in um, scientific endeavors in other contexts and in the COVID-19 pandemic for sure through funding uh, of work that's important, um, but also as a convener of um, scientific uh, leaders, researchers, um, et cetera. And then these two um, are related, the informational role of um, the WHO. So here you see, um, th this was uh, highly contentious, as you know, right? And to this day, um, no one seems to be really sure uh, about how much uh, access um, experts were given or denied um, when in, uh, in China um, to investigate the origins of, of the virus. So point of uh, great contention uh, here. Um, and one in which we saw the limitations uh, that the organization faces, uh, but nonetheless, this is part of the function of, of the WHO. So as wh whether it's facing limitations is, is, a, is a separate or practical obstacles is a separate question, but definitely one of the roles uh, of the um, World Health Organization and now toward facing um, one, um, and again, um, tying back to the advisory role uh, of, um, of the WHO. Um, so now that we have surveyed um, the different roles of um, the organization, I want to just go back to this idea of the declaration of pandemic and the other one that I mentioned earlier, the public health emergency of international concern, which formally really is the highest level of um, alerts um, that the WHO can um, issue. Um, the, from, from a law um, and soft law perspective, the organization has a new set of rules that came into play um, in 2005. And that set of rules instituted, created this figure of um, the public health emergency of international concern, which the WHO has declared on a number of, uh, of cases. So Ebola and Zika multiple times, we probably remember, if, if nothing else, these two, this is the big, the 2014-16 uh, outbreak, the Zika one. Um, later on, um, there were outbreaks of Ebola, but none uh, affecting uh, the United States. Um, 2014 polio, which, uh, which has been eradicated, um, here um, that also triggered a declaration. And the first declaration 2009 actually happened in the previous pandemic. So whether you noticed it or not, we had a pandemic, a, a formal pandemic that was declared as such in 2009, originating out of North America. Um, and that was the first time that the WHO um, declared uh, an outbreak um, under, this, uh, under this new terminology and formal um, character, so a public health emergency of international uh, concern. And some of the things that we are going to see about perceptions of WHO's response um, to the pandemic, I think have to be understood in light of this evolution. So WHO has this mechanism to declare there's something really serious from a public health perspective going on. It had used it multiple times before the, the pandemic, um, but some people um, were somewhat critical of how the, the declaration was handled. So I'll, I'll get to that as I explain some of the things you might see here. Um, before I get to that, uh, I'm just, I have some uh, graphics. I'll go through those relatively quickly. I'm happy to share slides afterwards. Um, but I'm gonna go through, um, through these graphics um, just to illustrate how um, research from uh, the Pew Research Center um, has um, what they've told us about perceptions uh, about the WHO's response um, to, uh, to the pandemic. Um, here, people in 14 countries were asked whether the WHO had done a good job of responding to, uh, to the outbreak. Um, and uh, you see a uh, response in, in, in context, right? Um, so the, the graph uh, maps people who said, yes, the different organizations did a good, um, a good uh, job responding to, um, to the pandemic. Here on the left, you see uh, the country of the respondents and how they perceive their own country to have um, responded. And then here you see the WHO. So for instance, high confidence in its own governments and its response by um, people in, in Denmark, less so in the WHO, right? Similar to Denmark, Australia, very high levels uh, of confidence in the response by their own governments, but almost uh, dropping down to, to close to 50% of people saying, um, that WHO had done a good, uh, a good job. And you see um, 
differing numbers. Obviously, some like South Korea, uh, we, we understand uh, things in, in context, but notice that Japan, less than a quarter of people um, thinking um, WHO had done a good a good job. Um, also not very um, happy with the response in their um, in their in their own country, but this gives you a flavor of um, how different people in different countries have perceived the response to the WHO. So the numbers are never as high as uh, at the domestic uh, level, and in some cases are uh, really, uh, really uh, worrisome in terms of trust. And you cannot have an international organization with such a number of roles uh, in global public health having uh, levels of trust that are not solid. Um, that, that is not uh, good news. Um, and in the US, you see the, the evolution uh, here between spring and summer of 2020. So, uh, uh, early to mid stages of, um, of the response, uh, we've switched from a minority to a majority of people thinking the response was uh, somewhat could be labeled as, as good, but still the numbers are not convinced. And in America in particular, we're, we're fairly divided about it. And um, in, in the interest of time, I apologize, but I'm going to go uh, a bit quickly over the, the remaining, remaining graphics. Um, but um, here you can see uh, that there is uh, some correlation between the number of people who trust the UN, the United Nations as a whole, uh, and how they perceive um, the World Health Organization um, to be. Women in general um, were uh, more uh, optimistic about the response, uh, about how the WHO handled the pandemic than men. Um, and given the given uh, you know the, the needs to actually investigate whether the WHO uh, did in fact do the job it is um, it is supposed to to be doing and these perceptions right and the, the high levels of science contestation that um, it, it faced um, and remember this is at the time in which the US was uh, withdrawing from several international frameworks including uh, its support for the WHO so there was a, a WHO did, did an, an internal review. There was an independent panel that also uh, reviewed uh, the response of, of the WHO. Uh, and uh, it uh, found that um, the biggest issue had been uh, that in the wake of the declaration of a public health emergency of um, international concern, a lot of countries, so Asia was an early exception, but a lot of countries actually were not following the advice um, of the WHO. So the advisory function and informational functions of the WHO failing, uh, failing here. Um, one of the reasons um, um, that some researchers have um, brought up is this idea that um, they think the public um, health emergency of international concern declaration should have been issued a week um, earlier. And this is a lingering criticism of the organization that it, it reacts when it's marginally too light. So the, the WHO was even later um, in issuing a declaration. Again, this is not the pandemic declaration, it's the earlier um, one. Um, so they were even lighter in the opinion of many public health experts in the Ebola um, outbreak of 2014, uh, 2016. Uh, and these criticisms have lingered and have built up um, between, between the two um, uh, outbreaks. Um, and by the time um, FDA uh, declared the outbreak COVID-19 a, a pandemic, we're already against a, a backdrop uh, in which people um, think WHO is already again late to the game. Um, and like this formal declaration that was created in 2005, there's really no universal um, definition of pandemic. So at that point, you have the WHO in an extreme mode trying to, it, it has sounded the, the, the alarm. Um, countries are by and large not uh, cooperating. So they escalate past something that's their actual um, highest level um, of, um, of alarm. Uh, and, and that's, um, I think that speaks um, to some coordination uh, failures, but also a reputational uh, failure. The study that was performed did not frame it quite um, as, um, as such, but I think the WHO is facing a reputational uh, failure because when countries are not responding to um, repeated warnings, including the highest possible one uh, for a pandemic that involves a respiratory virus that's easily transmitted, um, I think this is a, um, a reputational failure. I um, 
I want to use the rest of the time that I have to talk briefly, and I'm happy to expand on this during the, the Q&A, uh, on the role of the health uh, organization um, as part of systems of production and distribution. And I left the, the rest uh, blank because I'm gonna use the example of vaccines, but this is not um, just vaccines. Um, this is uh, also at the level of other health goods that we might need on a regular basis, but especially to respond and to mitigate the effects uh, of a pandemic. So we could be talking about treatments, we could be talking about diagnostics, we could be talking about personal protective um, equip, uh, equipment, but obviously the one that we're all talking about is, is vaccines. So I'll relate my comments to that. And uh, per my uh, stopwatch, about three minutes I have left. So we went through the roles of um, the World Health Organization, um, its perception, the perception of its response to, to the pandemic. But that's not the only thing that WHO does, even though the organization uh, itself did not frame its uh, or does not frame um, its roles to include what I'm going to delve into um, right now. And the thing that I think the pandemic called attention to that doesn't get it as discussed as some of the reputational failures or the coordination failures at the advisory level, uh, at the informational level, et cetera, so the areas we've already surveyed, is that it is very. It would be very, very hard for us um, to uh, get vaccination to the point where it is um, at, or even to get new vaccines as quickly as we did, um, without some intervention of the World Health Organization. Bear in mind that it's still uh, limited uh, financially. The organization depends on on donations, and they're never going to be an extremely Power finance, powerful uh, player in an economic uh, sense. But again, their coordination function is extending um, to the levels of production and distribution of health goods. In the context of COVID, um, this is how it um, unfolded. Um, for vaccines to be produced, they have to be developed and tested. And this is done through uh, clinical trials that increasingly are global in, um, in nature. So WHO actually coordinates clinical trials whether there's a pandemic or outside uh, that, because typically, you know, particularly for vaccines against infectious um, diseases, you do need populations from a number of um, countries and areas where the disease is endemic. So WHO does play um, that role on a regular um, basis, but it was also instrumental in bringing players together to conduct clinical trials across many, many countries, you know, with weeks notice, um, basically. And, and we've had those here in, in St. Louis. In fact, we're going to have clinical trials for COVID vaccines here uh, for a couple of years um, to come. The other thing is distribution, right? So WHO has always worked in partnership with vaccine distribution oriented entities like, like Gavi, um, the Vaccine Alliance based in, um, in Geneva. So um, WHO also having a coordinating level at the distribution of, of vaccines. What I think is interesting, and I'll end with this um, in, in the current pandemic, is that I believe WHO now has a much more formal or formalized role uh, in these two areas, particularly as vaccines are, um, and so far as vaccines are um, concerned. And what I mean by this um, is that WHO oversaw and is now part of um, the construction of a number of things that it didn't use to have such a big footprint um, in. So WHO um, helped establish a public-private partnership and public-private partnerships have entered global health around the turn of the century um, in the early 2000s. And they keep appearing in multiple uh, spaces, but now WHO itself um, is coordinating, help coordinate with other organizations, a public-private uh, partnership specifically for the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. And it's called COVAX. Um, I published an article, article recently about that, and I'm happy to discuss how it works, what the shortcomings of the partnership um, are, how I think it should be remodeled, if, if, if that's of interest. Um, but um, we don't typically see the WHO um, do, um, do play this particular uh, role. And the pandemic pushed it um, to do that. Other organizations were operating much more at the R&D level. And WHO is also now collaborating with those organizations uh, more than it ever has uh, to uh, expedite research and development of, of vaccines. So those are two uh, really important uh, 
I think contributions during this pandemic, again, limited because the, again, the economic power of the WHO is limited, uh, but they're becoming involved with other um, organizations and in particular with public private partnerships. And this is a relative, a relatively new phenomenon. And the latest one, my latest sentence uh, in this presentation has to do with the fact that you might have read um, in, in media, um, newspapers, social media, there's, there's a, a considerable amount of debates going on uh, about waiving patent rights, intellectual property rights for COVID-19 vaccines, also something I'm happy to take questions uh, on. But WHO has now uh, actually sided uh, with the proponents of a waiver of intellectual property rights, which are the rights, rights that uh, if a vaccine manufacturer holds a patent on vaccine technology, they can prevent anybody else from making copies, from rep making replicas of the uh, of that particular type of vaccine technology. So there's a, a heated debate and the US and the EU are on opposite ends of the debate and WHO has um, said that they support uh, intellectual property policy. Again, this should be WIPO uh, or we, sh we would associate this more with WIPO than WHO, but they're moving, um, they've been active in this pandemic uh, in, that, um, in that area. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end here to make sure that um, I leave enough um, time for questions. Thank you for your time. And I'm happy to either expand on any point that I've made uh, or um, take any uh, questions on related topics that I might not have covered. Um, thank you very much. Uh, while I wait for the questions from our audience to materialize, let me give you the opportunity to expand on your reference to uh, this COFAX, um, uh, which struck me as a very interesting uh, uh, issue, and uh, I think we would all benefit from hearing more about it. All right, um, absolutely, and thanks for taking me up on that. I actually prepped a couple of um, slides, should there be questions about it, so let me just go back to sharing that with um, you. So here you have it, um, and this is what I meant by um, WHO now involved in uh, a much broader network of collaborations at the R&D level. So what um, WHO uh, actually did was to contribute towards the creation of a public-private partnership itself. So um, think about this. We've had public-private partnerships in this country um, for things like infrastructure, uh, and those, the modern uh, ones date back to, to the previous um, century. In global health law, if you had surveyed the field in the early 2000s, you would find you know, a couple of public-private partnerships. And then suddenly you start tracking how many are formed every year and the numbers explode into the dozens um, per year. Very few are, uh, are large. So Gavi uh, is the first vaccine procurement um, agency um, to be created global procurement agency or international organization to be created. And it itself, it is a public-private partnership and it's one of the oldest ones. And this is procurement. So this is sort of a, of a pool mechanism once you already have developed vaccines. CEPI, by contrast, was created in 2017 and it's sort of a push organization. So they're trying to fund um, R&D on vaccine technology, and they focus exclusively on vaccines against in, uh, infectious diseases, emerging infectious diseases. Precisely, it, they, were, they, they were launched at Davos in 2017, precisely because of the report of the WHO in the general sense that we were underprepared for a pandemic. So what happened during COVID is that you see the WHO partner with these two public-private partnerships to create in itself another public-private um, partnership. And they did so um, through an accelerator called uh, ACT Accelerator, which has, in terms of areas of action, what WHO calls as three pillars. One is devoted to diagnostics, the other one to through, um, therapeutics, and one to, um, to vaccines. And under this pillar, then they create the public-private partnership called COVAX. And um, COVAX is led primarily by Gavi because Remember, Gavi is a uh, vaccine procurement agency, but in collaboration with, uh, with others. Um, and uh, what they do is use the same legal mechanisms that were used for what you might have um, seen described as vaccine nationalism. So when countries, including um, the US, although the US in terms of 
how much vaccine dose was uh, ordered was by no means the, the highest purchase, purchaser. But basically what countries did was to take an advanced pur purchase agreement, which you, countries use all the time, governments, but also um, private uh, parties use all the time to pre-order something that hasn't yet been fully developed. The specificity here is that countries were pre-ordering something that had not even been approved by FDA or their uh, corresponding agencies um, elsewhere, but that's how several countries, including the US, guaranteed early supply of vaccines and some other countries were not able to, um, um, to do it. So this public-private partnership um, that the WHO helps coordinate uses exactly the same mechanism, but instead of contracting bilaterally, um, they uh, contract with uh, a number of vaccine manufacturers. And then on the other hand, they request uh, commitments from countries. Some are self-funded um, so, and, and these tend to be countries in the global north. Some receive some financing help um, to, to be part of the procurement pool, to be part of COVAX. But basically they're doing what countries did at the bilateral level and they're negotiating tendentially or uh, uh, as a rule with more um, more vaccine manufacturers than a country alone would. So instead of negotiating with two or three, they try to negotiate with five or six. That brings the cost of the good that you're buying down. And they're trying to develop, to, to distribute things um, to as many countries as possible. The mechanism is far from, uh, from um, perfect uh, and it's undercapitalized. But th again, this is something the WHO has never done even in the context of a pandemic. And I think this is significant. I have a question about the, uh, um, a political question about U.S. attitudes towards the World Health Organization. How would you characterize the U.S. attitude towards WHO before this current pandemic? And how would you characterize U.S. Uh, attitudes now? Okay. Um, so if, if you're asking before the pandemic, as in literally before, uh, you know, in like 2019, um, that, that's that's one set of considerations. I, I think that the the cutoff point, so to speak, before the pandemic really is around the 2016 um, election, because this trust of international organizations built between 2016 and uh, and at least 20, uh, 2020 to some extent. And what we saw, the idea that the US was going to um, withdraw support um, of, um, of the WHO and even withdraw from international agreements like the Paris uh, Accord, uh, it's an expression of that. So um, the US um, position for the better part of five years was one of, I, I would classify it primarily as um, distrust and we were, um, largely antagonistic of entities like the, the World Health Organization. A lot of people were critical of the US's early response at the domestic level of the pandemic. Um, and I will say that uh, a lot of people think that one of the ways in which the administration attempted to justify um, some of the numbers that didn't look as um, encouraging as they uh, were made to um, at the time in terms of infections and propagation of, of, of the virus, um, et cetera, uh, by criticizing the WHO and trying to assign blame to predominantly the international player, that was a game that was played um, domestically as well. And it served the interests of those who were trying um, to lessen the, um, the failures at the domestic level in, in the response. Having said that, I will disclose that I did consult uh, for uh, the campaign for the, I'm not affiliated with the current administration, but I did consult for the Biden um, campaign. So obviously uh, you, should, uh, you should take what uh, I've just said uh, and well, you should understand understand it in uh, in a context, right? Um, I uh, I am critical of the U.S.'s response last year to the um, to the pandemic. Um, I think that it is absolutely fair to say that um, the previous administration uh, managed to sow a lot of seeds of doubt. Um, surrounding the WHO. The WHO has many failures, as I've mentioned, um, and some of the criticism is justified, but I think the US really undermined some of the organization's international credibility. The current administration is working um, 
with uh, with international partners, including the WHO. That does not mean I mean necessarily supportive of everything they've done. Uh, for instance, uh, with regard to the waiver in which the US joined the WHO, I actually think that's that's uh, the wrong decision to to be making, uh, waiving uh, intellectual property rights. But I want to put my answer in context so you know where I come from and how my views are um, informed. Well, thank you. Um, I, I have a, a more generic question about the uh, the problems um, of an organization like WHO, not exclusively, and the tension between these international organizations and the concept of national sovereignty. How do you uh, how do you create a balance between these two ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, so you probably have noticed I have an accent. Um, I, I was born <laughs> in Portugal, and um, technically I was not born in the European Union. There was no, you know, no such thing when I was born. Uh, it was created after that. Uh, it was still called something else. Uh, but I, I was born in uh, in Portugal. Portugal is not part of the EU at, uh, or the, the European communi uh, community at the time. Um, and then I came um, here. But when, one of the things that had I stayed, I would have witnessed would be this phenomenon of losing, progressively losing sovereign powers to a federalistic um, structure, right? Um, so as somebody who's from uh, Europe, the idea that there are some things, some components of uh, your sovereign powers that countries sometimes self-limit is not completely uh, unrealistic or, uh, you know, something that I couldn't uh, endorse in some contexts. And I think in many, uh, in many areas, we've learned that sometimes we have to think past national lines and national um, divides, even for things like national security, right? You might not be able to protect a single country just by operating within borders. We'll get hit uh, from, from a different um, angle. So I, I think that this means that, and I'm not suggesting we give up sovereign powers in the area of health um, necessarily, but an understanding similar to the one that European countries had to go through in order to say, well, you know, some of our uh, policies at, you know, beginning at monetary level and extending um, elsewhere, we are going to lose some, some room uh, for uh, maneuvering in those areas because we decided to create this entity, which in itself has a lot of problems, right? It's not that they're not struggling uh, on their own, but I don't see how else, how else you can conceive of global public health because if we don't voluntarily, and all of this has, and, and like some sovereign actions, this has largely to rely on volunteerism, but I think countries need to come together. There's now talk of a pandemic treaty, for instance, and not lessen their, um, their sovereign powers, but agree that they are going to be bound by certain principles for a response. You can't just rely on everybody listening to what WHO is, uh, is saying and assume that countries are going to respond accordingly. I mean, COVID-19 proved that's not going to be to be the case, but I think there's a case to be uh, made that countries should really discuss something like a pandemic um, treaty. So that's negotiated ex ante, right? So we don't have to on the fly be thinking, who are we gonna listen to? We have time to think about it critically and commit to sets of actions that we're gonna take come the next pandemic or epidemic. That's how I view it. How would you assess China's performance in the early days of the pandemic? I'm not asking a question about did this um, virus originate in a laboratory or in a public space, uh, but how do you assess their handling of it once we in fact have this disease and its first cases, first reported cases are in China? You know, uh, I have limited information. I think that's that's the first thing I need to to say. Like many other people, um, I have limited uh, information. I'm not an expert um, on 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 the many of the things that China has done. Uh, I'm more of an expert on what international organizations are um, doing in the U.S. has done. Um, the the only thing I can say about uh, about this um, is then. China and some other neighboring um, states have a very different model of um, responding to public health crises. They can enforce measures, um, sort of you know top-down uh, approaches, because they rely on a relationship with their citizens that would not pass muster here in the U.S. and in many other um, countries. So I think part of the answer to that it's it's highly specific. 
what might have been a success there from a public health perspective, whatever they've contained early enough and reopened earlier than we did, it's not transferable to uh, the reality here or in a few other countries. They were also incredibly fast developing their vaccines. So WHO two days ago um, just recommended the second Chinese COVID-19 vaccine and many concerns attached to that. The way they've conducted um, clinical trials, the way they've tried to buy influence in places like Africa, for instance, for running clinical trials there and then providing countries with uh, vaccine doses as they build other types of relationships. So I'm not saying it's necessarily you know, something we should not be questioning, but they came together very quickly, for instance, even they produced vaccines before we did. Why? Because a lot of companies have ties to, um, to the stage, right? So uh, it's just a different reality. I think it's absolutely worth um, looking um, at, but I would caution again, any lessons we might want to take for a place like the US, just because our notions on, on many things that you need to respond to a pandemic, including public health powers are vastly different. Uh, do you know anything about uh, the morale situation now at the World Health Organization? Obviously, they were subjected to quite a lot of criticism, but over time, perhaps they've recovered. That's really a question. Um, so I, I think it's a period of transition. I, I think they were already go, undergoing a period of transition, rather, rather frankly. The Obviously, everything is louder in the context of COVID-19, but the criticism during Ebola was harsh. And I think some of it was deserved. I think WHO was actually really light intervening, whether it was the informational function, the advisory function. It's, it's necessary for it to perform its scientific functions, right? But if you neglect the other two, that's a deficit for, for their type of, uh, of organization. So I think they received some very well-deserved criticism during Ebola. And I think that began marking sort of what I would call uh, personally a transition period. And I think COVID-19 amplified this. I, I think it built on, on something that was on, uh, ongoing. Um, some of the people I know at the WHO are exhausted, haven't slept. Uh, you know, like Dr. Fauci says, he hasn't slept much. Um, some are physically exhausted to a point they have not, uh, they have not been. Legally, as you can imagine, I know, I know lawyers, right? So legally, uh, people working in, in legal issues have negotiated uh, agreements that speeds, you know, uh, unthought uh, of uh, before. Um, having the U.S. back on board, uh, everybody's breathing a sign of relief for obvious reasons, right? Such a major player in international uh, relations. The WHO is also taking stock of some of its um, of its failures. I'm not sure they're um, they're doing just enough, but again, in the context of a, of a pandemic, I would not be screaming from the rooftops, you know, reform yourselves now. But I I, I think they're beginning to take a, a, a harsher look at you know how timely their interventions sometimes are. I don't think we're quite there yet. But again, the WHO cannot do anything on its own, right? Because anything we might tell WHO to do, even things like, you know, get better at communicating, not just with countries, with people like you and me, when you release something about a virus or vaccine, they are just never as good as people or entities specializing in vaccine misinformation, right? And if we want to make them better, they need to hire more people and they need to have better software tools, et cetera. So this costs money, all of this costs money. So a lot of trade-offs there. Uh, do you think the, now I'm asking you to project a global view, which is easily beyond any single individual. Do you think, uh, the reaction to the successes and failures in managing the pandemic uh, lead to a global climate of more support for the World Health Organization, for a stronger World Health Organization, or a sense that it needs to be replaced? Which direction? I, I think that it's maintenance of the status quo, institutionally speaking, so still at WHO, not a different institution. I think it's... Um, I think it took a reputational hit. Um, so I think more people will be distrustful of what WHO will say in the near future. It's not dissimilar to what happened to the FDA in that sense. Some very weird things happened at the FDA last year. Um, overstatements of data, right? With public health officials having to apologize the head of the FDA for what they had said at press conferences. Even if like me, um, you think that the procedure they used to approve the vaccines domestically was actually um, good. It was solid. Given what happened uh, 
at such a big level. I think it's unfair to ask of people to fundamentally trust organizations that messed up, right, in, in, in public understandings. So I, I don't think we're at the stage, I don't think it's desirable, but I don't think public opinion wise, we're at the stage where we will have a push, a meaningful push to replace the WHO. And the COVAX um, structure I told you about, which is just for the pandemic, if anything, people are not saying this might become a permanent sub-organization, right? And we have FDA and um, WHO in an even greater tangle of um, institutional players uh, in global um, public health. But I think it's moving forward towards permanence of the WHO. But I think that the number of people having doubts about the organization has grown and will even a year, two years from now, be considerably larger than it was two or three years ago. And some of it, it's on the WHO, a lot is not, right? But that's one of the limitations of, of the organization, right? You can't control many of the things that happen to it. Well, uh, Professor Santos Ruchman, thank you very much for a very informative uh, and presentation about a very complicated issue, but obviously one of great importance to all of us. We've spent the entire past year, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I have, Two uh, more questions. Oh, well, uh, you've really covered these issues already. So I'm going to close our, our, our session by thanking you. Um, we will start watching the remainder of the World Health Organization video uh, momentarily, but I wanna remind our audience that we will be back in two weeks on June 17th and Professor Jean-Germain Gros, a professor of political science at University of Missouri, St. Louis, will be speaking about another hot topic, controversial topic, China's role in Africa. And I'm, I have no doubt that he will be touching on conflict between the United States and China in Africa, as well as other parts of the world. Uh, let's now uh, view the, uh, the balance of the Foreign Policy Association video and thank you uh, all for being part of our audience today. Uh, please remember that the World Affairs Council is a membership organization. We certainly invite you to join us and become a member. Uh, it's only by having an ever-growing cohort of members that we'll be able to continue to present programs like this to you. So thank you again. Thank you, Professor Santos Rushman, and thank you to our audience. Uh, we'll begin the video now. With tensions mounting between the U.S. and China, President Trump announced that the U.S., traditionally the largest contributor to the World Health Organization, would stop funding that institution. Leaving the World Health Organization at the height of the most devastating pandemic in more than a century is the height of lunacy. It impedes the U.S. ability to learn from other countries. It creates open season for China to step in and drive the World Health Organization in the direction that China thinks is in its interest. It's a humanitarian blow to vulnerable communities all around the world, which in turn is a blow to U.S. leadership and U.S. influence. The WHO was deliberately delaying the announcement of the severity or delaying or artificially underestimating or understating the severity of COVID-19, at least in the early stage of the pandemic. As late as February 4th, the Secretary General of the uh, WHO was still saying that there's no need for a country to overreact to COVID-19. Just because something is called the World Health Organization doesn't mean it's an unmitigated good that you can't criticize. I've had experience with the World Health Organization since my days in the Reagan presidency, and it's not the lean, mean, disease-fighting machine it was right after it was created in its early years where it had enormous success. Mass infection and epidemics are a threat to every city, to every nation. Scientific and medical work on a local scale are no longer enough. Mm -hmm. 
When delegates from around the world convened in San Francisco in the waning days of World War II to outline a framework for global governance, they made certain that health would be part of the mandate for the new United Nations. They recognized that the fight against infectious disease depended on global coordination. They had experienced the health consequences of the Second World War, of course, and uh, they were very clear that uh, one would only have economic development in the world if one also had a healthy population. There were epidemics of tuberculosis and other epidemic diseases, and there was risks of dysentery and other you know, risks to health that people were moving around populations and so on after the war. So it was agreed that WHO would be formed and that there would be international cooperation. What it tries to do is to provide technical guidance to countries around the world on how to respond to health challenges. It tries to set standards with the input of countries around the world for the response to global health crises, to medical issues, to public health issues. Even during the most antagonistic years of the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union managed to cooperate on matters of health. The eradication of smallpox originated with a resolution proposed by the Soviets. It is the only human disease ever to have been eradicated. But think about that. In the 20th century alone, 300 million people are thought to have died of smallpox. But after a few decades, many observers had grown discontent with the WHO and its broadening mission. If you take a look at what the organization prides itself on, which is the near eradication of polio, the eradication of smallpox, combating other uh, infectious diseases, these were the focus of the organization in its early days. And the organization lost its focus in the 1970s and 1980s and started focusing on a number of different issues that arguably should be the focus of domestic health agencies and domestic governments. I remember back in the Bush 41 administration, the early Clinton administration, the global response to HIV AIDS was taken out of the WHO and made a separate UN component because people simply felt the World Health Organization wasn't up to the challenge. And I think since then, the bureaucracy hasn't gotten any better. Like many other international organizations, the WHO has no mechanism to enforce its authority and relies on achieving consensus from its member states. No one gave WHO the authority to enforce compliance. No country wanted them to have that degree of authority, including the United States, so they simply don't have it. Member states, when things like health security crop up, get incredibly defensive, nationalistic, and, and the WHO has to navigate. It doesn't have the authority to tell other governments what to do. It has to also play a political role because WHO can be invited into a country, but they can also be uh, kicked out of a country. We saw this recently with COVID-19, where Burundi expelled three WHO high officers. And so WHO has to kind of walk this line. We have the authority that the member states give us. WHO is what its 194 member states want it to be. And really, it is not a question of exercising authority or compelling uh, member states to do something. It is about persuasion. And that really is how the multilateral system works. In 2002, Doctors in southern China began documenting an alarming outbreak. Patients infected with a new type of virus were developing a condition known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Faced with the threat of this contagious new virus, the WHO sprang into action. They had a very strong director general, a woman named Gro Brundtland, who was a former prime minister. And when China at that point was not being very forthcoming with data about what was happening with SARS, uh, she took a pretty strong stance and chastised China and really pushed China to be much more forthcoming about the data that was coming out of the SARS outbreak. 
WHO had criticized government in the past for not being transparent about health emergencies going on within their borders or infectious disease outbreaks and had been heavily criticized for that. And Brundtland went ahead and did it anyway. But in the aftermath of the SARS outbreak, the WHO's member states grew concerned about how much authority the organization had appropriated. The overall reaction from member states was kind of, you know, great job, don't do it again. The naming and shaming function, calling for trade and travel restrictions were all things that made governments uncomfortable more broadly as sort of an infringement on sovereignty. What came out of SARS was something called the International Health Regulations, sort of a set of rules of the road the WHO and all the countries were supposed to follow in the context of cross-national disease outbreaks. And part of IHR was the idea that WHO should not chastise and really stand up to member states. As I have said before, and I can repeat, it took much too long time before we got uh, that kind of collaboration to get the, the, the data and to know how, what advice to give and how to help them contain the outbreak. It took much too long time. There are no IAEA-like authorities within the international health regulation, and that was not uh, an oversight. Uh, I was on the uh, negotiating side uh, uh, for the United States, and it was a very deliberate decision. For most of the WHO's existence, it has relied heavily on the U.S. to finance its operations. Traditionally, the United States has been the largest provider of funding to the World Health Organization, both in terms of assessed funding, which is sort of the dues to the organization, but also in terms of voluntary contributions to the organization as well. When WHO started, it was mainly these assessed contributions by member states. Right now, we actually have a balance that the assessed contribution by member states are only 20% of the WHO's budget. About 80% of its funding comes in the form of voluntary contributions from donors, mostly member state governments like the US, but also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a huge one. And that money is largely earmarked, meaning that the donors decide what they want it to be used for. Concerns about the WHO's independence have grown now that the voluntary contributions controlled by member states make up the vast majority of the organization's budget. This changed over time because wealthy countries pushed to reduce the mandatory contributions and replace them in some way with voluntary contributions. And the implications for the organization are enormous. That opens up the WHO to the highest bidder in terms of who provides funding is going to have more political influence. And that was one of the major issues thus far in the COVID response is that they're really focused on making sure that they don't upset anybody. Within the past decade, several international commissions put forth proposals to modernize the WHO. Not one of those reforms was put into action. What is the core of the proposed reform? for member states to provide greater powers of independence for the WHO Director General and his or her Secretariat to collect data and secondly to issue warnings and when data is not forthcoming to blow the whistle internationally on why that data is not forthcoming. At present all these reform proposals that have been put on the WHO table have been allowed to drift away by WHO member states. Now that the COVID-19 pandemic has awakened the world to the potential danger of emerging disease, experts debate whether the WHO needs broader authority to enforce its mandate. No, the World Health Organization doesn't have any kind of enforcement authority. It really shouldn't have enforcement authority. This is a situation where member states need to come together to work together to pledge to honor certain standards and certain practices. It's not ultimately just about putting some authority on paper to say the director general can do X, Y, or Z. It's also about thinking through the steps of you know, why would a member state then actually choose to comply with that. So if WHO gets the authority to be able to go into China against China's will, 
then it needs to have the authority to go into the United States against America as well. My sense is this is a nice idea, but countries are not ultimately going to agree to it. Certainly not the United States, not China. Some critics assert that the WHO is no longer the best organization to coordinate global health. This was a different virus. Th this was a house on fire. And WHO is simply not, at this time, geared to be a fireman. It was created in 1948. There were 48 member states. Now, fast forward today, we have 194 member states. Many of those states are low and middle income countries, and they require very different things from WHO. We still need the WHO no matter what. We need that official body. But the question is, do we need some complementary entity that would be able to do this inspection or audit kind of approach? Or will we end up in a situation where we have nothing because the states weren't really able to cooperate with a China that's challenging not only the United States, but the whole liberal world order and its principles? As the WHO's assessed contributions from nation states have tailed off, some private organizations have stepped in to fill the void. Its funding is incredibly precarious. It is tremendously underfunded. It has this tremendous mandate to cover sort of all health issues all over the world. And it does that on a budget that's about the budget of a large hospital system in the US. About 10% of the overall WHO budget is now also financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Again, mainly in focus programs. With a nationalist tide sweeping the globe, politicians are proving increasingly unwilling to tolerate interference from multilateral institutions. The WHO must figure out how to operate effectively in a difficult geopolitical environment. There is a rise of nationalism in very many places, and it does affect the WHO indirectly by making some countries less likely to contribute or be supportive of multilateral initiatives. To what extent the great powers are willing to manipulate international organizations to serve their own cause, to implement their own agenda. That's really the, the problem, and that's an independent problem from nationalism. What you have now is nationalist rhetoric, but internationalist challenges. It's not a coincidence that nationalist leaders, by and large, have fared the least well in tackling the COVID pandemic, because they're trying to bring a set of tools to bear that don't take account of our connectedness. The first step, some experts say, is to evaluate whether China's influence within the WHO has grown too strong. The World Health Organization was concerned that if it was very critical of China and its lack of cooperation, lack of transparency, that that could restrict further the World Health Organization's access to Wuhan and access and cooperation that the Chinese government was getting. So it was over the top in terms of its praise for China. China has been very skillful at entering and penetrating a lot of international institutions that were really created as part of the liberal Western world order and based on liberal values such as transparency and openness, etc. But China, when it enters these institutions, although it subscribes to them, it signs all the agreements, it doesn't respect the rules. One of the reasons WHO was subservient to China in the coronavirus pandemic was that a Chinese national had been director general for 10 years uh, before, uh, before the current uh, DG. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. Every member state in every international organization tries to get its way to the degree that China has influence that it should not have within the WHO. That's a failure of the Trump administration and of diplomacy and of other countries to build coalitions to block China's efforts 
At a moment of rising tension between Beijing and Washington, the WHO has become a battleground. COVID-19 has fallen smash in the middle of a geopolitical conflict between the United States and between China. For political reasons, the United States has held back and has not joined uh, many of these attempts to create a, a truly global approach. One of the big worries I had was that if one of the big countries does badly domestically, if COVID really hits them badly, then the big danger is they will then externalize that into geopolitics. And the Trump administration decided the WHO was a, a good way of critiquing and harming China. The challenge currently facing American policymakers is to determine how the U.S. can play a leadership role in the field of health. In a bipartisan way, most people have recognized that investments in developing health systems is an investment in U.S. national security. So I think it is a mistake to go looking for credit if your investments in global public health infrastructure are only about that you are missing the point. People don't talk about smallpox anymore because the United States led on this, provided the funding um, to do that. Polio is another one that we're close to eradicating. And so we know how to do this. It's gonna take all of us working together. Other countries work within the institutions to push back at China, whereas the United States chooses uh, more and more to depart from these institutions, probably because China and the U.S. are main opponents in the world order, and China is trying to push the United States down from being the dominant power in the world. A lesson of COVID is, maybe the, the overarching lesson, is that there is no them. It is just us. We are all susceptible to the same microbes. Individually, we are no match for nature, but together we are. I cannot imagine, even now, the US actually leaving WHO. It is, to me, unthinkable. Going forward, the most crucial question will be what lessons the international community can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic to make sure it responds more effectively to the next emerging disease. Back in 1948, the WHO's constitution boldly proclaimed that the achievement of any state in the promotion and protection of health is of value to all. But today, the stakes for the global community are even higher. In our interconnected world, the failure of any state is a danger to all. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Discussion groups meet online via Zoom and Google Meets, in person at community centers, libraries, places of worship, and homes across the country to discuss global issues with their community. Participants read the eight-topic briefing book, meet to discuss each topic, and complete a ballot which shares their views with Congress. To start or join a discussion group in your community, visit fpa.org or call 1-800-477-5836. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. Next time on Great Decisions. Although the world faces a host of challenges that no country can solve alone, Americans are notoriously ambivalent about the appeal of multilateralism. The end of the global order? Next time on Great Decisions. <laughs>